Well, good morning and good afternoon again to everyone um, and welcome to what I hope will be a very uh, interesting and thought provoking session presented by Good Shepherd um, Asia Pacific. My name is Gendry and I'm the Director of Mission at Good Shepherd Australia and I'll be facilitating our presentations today. I would like to begin by acknowledging that I'm meeting with you today on the land of the Wurundjeri people here in Melbourne, Australia. Our First Nations people have been custodians and caretakers of this land and nearby waters for thousands of years. I pay respects to elders past, present and emerging who have maintained the longest living continuous culture in the world. Today's program is a parallel event of the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women 66th session. And the priority theme at the UN this year is achieving gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls in the context of climate change, environmental and disaster risk reduction policies and programs. The care of our lands and our planet has have never been of more critical importance than at this time. So staff from our Good Shepherd programs in Nepal, Indonesia, Myanmar and Australia will share the impacts of climate change on women and girls in their countries and the need for reconciliation with the land as an important step in transforming our current situation. Key themes related <clears throat> to climate change reduction and impacts that we'll discuss today include the impact on tourism and the local economy, what it means to lose your connection with the land due to monoculture development by multinationals, natural disasters due to mining and degradation of the land, and continuous cycles of natural disasters impacting the resilience of women, girls, and communities. Climate change is a global crisis, and it will take the will and effort of all, individuals, communities, regions, businesses, governments, and economies to make a difference. This is an issue that can only be tackled by an integrated system for impact. Together, we can. So before we get into the presentations, I invite you throughout the session to use the chat box to share your thoughts or questions, which will be responded to halfway by the panel. And also, um, as and you're listening, perhaps now. use your journal or some note paper to note down any key reflections you might have. And you might want to keep a note as you're listening in response to these questions. What are the key messages coming through the presentations? So you may just listen. What are the key messages coming through the presentations? And what is your call to action as you listen to the presentations? What is your call to action as you listen? Well, let's begin our program. And to begin our sharing today, Emma O'Neill, Senior Policy and Advocacy Advisor at Good Shepherd Australia, will set the scene across Asia Pacific, highlighting some of the key factors and root causes that leave women and girls significantly disadvantaged and impacted by the dynamic changes in our climate. So Emma, welcome to the session and I hand over to you. Thank you, Gentry, and lovely to see everyone on the screens today. I'm just having a little trouble sharing my screen at the moment, <laughs> but I think we're all good. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Just put it onto slideshow, Emma. Thank you, Chendri. Is that all good, everyone? Yes, that's fine, Emma. 
Okay, thank you. So today, Good Shepherd will be talking about the idea of integral ecology and the impact of climate change on women and children, as seen in our work across Asia Pacific. Like Gendry, I would first like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people in Melbourne, or NAM as it's traditionally known. Aboriginal people are the first caretakers of these lands. This land always was and always will be Aboriginal land. We acknowledge the sovereignties of all First Nations people in this audience today and recognise that First Nations communities around the world are worst affected by ecological destruction and climate change. And we support their fight for social and climate justice. So what brings Good Shepherd here today? Climate change really does go to the heart of our mission to achieve gender equality and social justice for women and girls. It's increasingly clear that women and children are particularly affected by climate change. Women are more likely to live in poverty and face financial hardship and have less money to, to adapt. For example, by making their homes more resilient in extreme weather. One of the great injustices is that women have captured less of the wealth from fossil fuel extraction over the last few centuries and now fare the worst. And this is especially so in colonial contexts where lands have been destroyed and the wealth has been taken by foreign entities. And this is of course an ongoing process. And as is very well known, women are at risk of gender violence and exploitation in disasters and as migrants and refugees, climate refugees. So what do we mean by integral ecology at Good Shepherd? It means we acknowledge the deep interconnections between all living things and our relationship to our surroundings. We consider the human impact on nature through our actions, both positive and negative impacts, um, and how dependent we are on, our, on nature as our life support system. We acknowledge that we have an obligation of care and stewardship that extends across generations. So Good Shepherd is pursuing this integral ecology approach that really centers environmental care in our mission and services. This includes our ways of being as organizations like sourcing sustainable energy or minimizing waste. It includes using nature in healing and recovery from trauma. And most especially for today's session, it means fighting for those changes to government policies and business practices so we can heal the planet and build resilience to the climate change that is already locked in. For Good Shepherd, climate change is fundamentally an issue of social, racial and economic justice. Major structural transitions that are, will inevitably take place over the coming dec decades will entrench gender equalities and wealth disparities unless they include justice measures. So for example, Good Shepherd is seeing this in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And this photo here, which some of you may be familiar with, this shows a woman named Mama Natalie and her children, John and King, and their story was shown um, quite recently on Australian TV. This family is having to do extremely dangerous work, mining the minerals that go into the batteries that are needed for the energy trans transition. Now, while this transition is greatly needed, and we support that, um, women like Mama Natalie are not seeing any economic benefits and the working conditions are absolutely appalling and foreign entities are looting their lives. The other part of the justice story is that the world will miss out on climate change mitigation opportunities if women don't have full economic and social participation. For example, equal opportunities for decent work in land restoration, conservation, the circular economy and sustainable industries. So it's very clear that the systems that have underpinned the fossil fuel era are not fit for the task ahead on a number of measures. 
we really need to undo these systems if we're going to heal the planet and ensure everyone can adapt. So as we've been um, chatting as, as a group, we've realised that across Asia Pacific, Good Shepherd is seeing a range of common climate change impacts on women and children. And these impacts show that climate change is affecting major social, economic and women's rights under the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, under CEDAW, the, way, the, the main women's rights instrument, um, and under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So first of all, climate change affects the right to work and a decent living, as Gendry touched on at the start. Good Shepherd is working alongside women who can no longer farm because they've been denied access to land and these lands are being destroyed by deforestation and monoculture. Ecotourism sites like the Himalayas are at risk, affecting livelihoods. We also see women and children who have to migrate because their lands are being destroyed by resource exploitation and ecological destruction, which in turn fuels climate change. Turning to that next fundamental human right, climate change makes it, makes it much harder to achieve an adequate standard of living. Many women lack adequate housing that protects them from extreme weather. Food insecurity is a big issue. Uh, droughts, floods and other events mean failed crops, uh, disruptions in supply chains and then higher prices for food. There's also a lack of sustainable, affordable energy to help people cope during extreme weather. And women are particularly affected by water shortages. It's often the women who are having to collect water, who then have to travel further to, to do so and their safety can be put at risk in the process. And then the, of course, there's the violence dimension. Uh, we know that violence against women and girls is already at devastating levels with one in three women worldwide um, having experienced physical or sexual violence. And it's now quite well established that we, we see an increase in gender violence during um, and following disasters, often a number of years following disasters, whether that's due to unsafe living environments or major life stressors um, and other factors. And women and children are also vulnerable to abuse when they have to migrate and work in informal economies where there are no um, labour standards or formal protections. And finally, Good Shepherd is really keen to talk about the mental and emotional and spiritual um, impacts of climate change. Climate change is affecting our right to mental health and that is, that is a human right. Um, in our work, we're seeing grief due to the death of people and animals, um, due to ecological destruction, um, the breakdown of communities when people have to migrate or after a disaster, they have to leave. And we're more generally seeing that trauma, um, depression and other mental health impacts um, yeah, due to disasters, due to violence, um, financial stress, um, and migration. So there are obviously really big impacts to deal with. We're, we're living through a, a time of, of huge change and challenges, um, but there are opportunities here. So what are some of the major things we need to focus on changing and what opportunities exist for women in particular um, as we work to heal the planet? And this photo, for example, shows a worker at a women's co-op in Mauritania that has its own solar plant that supplies energy to the market garden, a big market garden um, that produces food for local consumption uh, by families and also sale in nearby towns. First and foremost, we need rapid decarbonisation, equitable rapid decarbonisation this decade if we're going to limit global heating to 1.5 degrees. Um, beyond this point, adaptation becomes much harder or impossible. We can't count on that. And 
I would like to acknowledge that high emitters such as Australia have a special responsibility um, to reduce emissions um, within, within the Asia Pacific. Women can be a really active part of climate change mitigation by leading ecological restoration in their own communities. They can be given land rights and access um, that allows them to be stewards and caretakers of that land and have secure livelihoods through sustainable farming and other work. And this is especially the case for First Nations women who hold deep climate and environmental knowledge and have been denied economic justice. We can build an inclusive post-carbon economy, because that's where we're moving, that provides women with decent work and doesn't replicate those business as usual practices in, in existing economies that deny women economic benefits. And it's good to see um, the UN raise this as an issue in the lead up to um, the Commission on the Status of Women this year. And finally, there's an urgent need to provide adequate climate safe housing. So that, that adequate standard of living that we have a right to that can keep women and children comfortable and safe during extreme heat and other events. And we also need to design or redesign social protections like income measures with climate change in mind. Um, we're very conscious that while there is um, a lot of overconsumption in the world, there is also um, a lot of underconsumption of basics like energy and food and transport. And we should be aiming to redistribute consumption, like sustainable consumption, um, and have that redistribution occur within countries and between countries and good, good climate change policy um, will do that. So I'd now like to hand back to Gendry to introduce the country case studies that will take you into the details of, of these themes in more depth. Uh, thank you very much, Emma, for setting uh, the overarching scene into what is a pretty confronting cross-border issue but also for highlighting some of the opportunities as well. So we have four presentations now from the ground, people who have lived experience through the people that they're working with within Good Shepherd. And I'd like to um, introduce the first presentation, which will be from Govinda Batarai, Program Manager, and Taskila Nicholas, Country Representative from the Good Shepherd MDO based in Nagpur, India. And they'll share with us the impact of climate change at a local level on women, children and communities largely dependent on tourism within Nepal. So Govinda, I'll hand over to you now. Uh, thank you, Zendri. Uh, I will uh, begin sharing the presentation. Yeah, can you see uh, my screen? Yes, can do. Yeah, allow me one minute, one moment. I am having some issues sharing the screen. Yes, uh, namaste everyone uh, from Nepal. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all for your presence and uh, showing solidarity on the issue. So today uh, we'll be talking about the impact of climate change on women and children in, 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 in Nepalese context. So um, I'm Govinda Bhattrai working as a program manager at Good Shepherd International Foundation Nepal. And today we are presenting on the issue of uh, climate change and its impact upon uh, people uh, and women uh, and children in particular. Uh, 
So let, let me begin uh, with the uh, fact that uh, Nepal is a very beautiful country with snow-capped Himalayas in, uh, in all of its uh, northern territory. The tallest peak, uh, Mount Sagarmatha, lies in Nepal, and eight out of 14 tallest uh, peaks above 8,000 meters are in Nepal. The ice reserved uh, uh, that are in these snow-capped Himalayas are sources to many rivers flowing to mountain and Thorai region that are densely populated. Uh, furthermore, uh, these uh, beautiful uh, Himalayas are very much uh, related with the uh, livelihoods of the people in uh, different geographical regions. Nepal is differentiated into Himalayan mountain and Parai um, uh, region. These Himalayas are also center of attractions to many tourists from different parts of the world, thus contributing to the economy of the people in the region. The water in the rivers originating from uh, these Himalayas is lifeline to agriculture, industry and different hydroelectric projects. Through such uh, rivers, Nepal holds huge potential of hydroelectric energy, which is also widely known as green energy, which is yet to be harnessed. Uh, this is to uh, say uh, that the ice in Himalayas is linked with the lives of people living below and uh, the development of the country as a whole. Having said that, um, there is a growing concern on the impact of climate change on these uh, snow-capped Himalayas. Uh, rapid rise in global temperature has led to massive melting of ice that is really threatening. Over the period of 33 years, there has been decrease uh, in ice reserve by almost 29%. And the consequences have already started appearing. Such consequences have a direct impact on the lives of the people and the economy of the country as a whole, as melting of ice in uh, ice reserves uh, is likely to increase the probabilities of glacial lake outburst flood, uh, flood in the region and is going to impact uh, the whole country. The consequences of climate change uh, cost a lot in terms of uh, livelihood of the people and the development of the country. A study in 2013 estimated the direct cost of uh, current climate variability and extreme events is equivalent to 1.5 to 2% of current GDP per year. That is approximately US dollar 270 to 360 million per year in 2013 prices. This signifies that Nepal is uh, paying the price for the consequences of uh, climate change. Nepal contributes significantly less percentage of CO2 emissions that is mainly responsible for climate change and rise of global temperature in particular. The, uh, the photos shown here are of an avalanche that occurred in 2012 and that took the lives of many people. The first picture shows the avalanche in the Himalayas and the second picture shows how human settlements below the Himalayas were washed away by the floods that was caused by the uh, avalanche. Furthermore, in terms of vulnerability, in terms of uh, climate change vulnerability, Nepal is ranked uh, in the fourth position in the world. The country stands in the 30th position in terms of vulnerability to climate changes related to flood risk, and in 11th position for the vulnerability of the earthquake. It is therefore necessary preparedness should be in place for um, the emergency response, particularly focusing on women and children. The experiences from Devastating earthquake in 2015 tell us that the women and children are the ones who are most vulnerable during the emergency situations. Moving further, uh, we'd like to discuss about the severity of the problems at the community level. Uh, for this, we'd like to share some of the findings of the survey that was done in 2016 by uh, Central Bureau of Statistics of Government of Nepal. The survey included more than 5,000 households representing all three uh, geographical regions, that is Himalaya, Mountain, and Torai region. The respondents were uh, over 45 years of age so that they can share the changing experiences and observations in and around their communities. In the survey, majority of more than 80% has mentioned that there has been drought in their communities. Significantly high percentage of people have reported decrease in and dry up 
of the surface water. This leads to the more consumption of time to women and girls who are mainly responsible for fetching water to their families and the cattle uh, in the rural settings, especially in the rural settings. It ultimately has impact upon the education of the girl child as well as income generation capabilities of a woman. Emerging of a new disease in crops has also been reported that is contributing to food scarcity uh, in the country. Also, increased incidence of human diseases were reported by the respondents. So considering all these uh, facts and situation, uh, we can uh, reach to a conclusion that the consequences of climate change are already impacting the lives of people in the community level. However, the differences in the severity of the consequences um, uh, amongst men in one hand and uh, women as well as children on the other are yet to be measured. Many times the dis disasters have forced people to migrate from their place of origin. The report by Internal Displacement Monitoring Center suggests that 12,000 displacements in 2018 were uh, mainly due to disasters. 461,000 people were displaced due to devastating floods in the Rai region in 2017. And 2,623,000 people were internally displaced due to the earthquake in 2015. So the differences of the impact uh, on the impact of such disasters upon men and women, as well as children are not well studied. The vulnerability of risk of various kinds is always higher upon women and children. And it is where the state actors really need to have clear plans and policies and civil society organizations like us uh, have to really support and advocate uh, for the necessary preparedness. The cases from the field that will be shared in this uh, presentation by Sister Toskila will let us know how timely intervention reduces the threats or vulnerabilities upon girls uh, on, and women during the time of disaster. Sister Toskila, I would like to uh, request you for the continuation of the remaining slides. Thank you, Govinda. Thank you. We can see that the Good Shepherd congregation, the Good Shepherd position papers emphasize on the responding to climate change through integral equality, integral ecology. As we implement the integral ecology, we focus on the following SDG goals, that is 6, 7, 12, 13, 14, and 15. We ensure strategies for the empowerment of women and girls in all our programs, including women in the decision-making process and advocacy. We promote environmental sustainability in our strategic plan for integral and right-based approaches. Now we shall listen to, to the case study Nostin <laughs> Sangi Yes,
Shush. Shushmita and her younger sister lost their parents and her younger brother due to landslide. They were left alone with nothing and nobody to care for. They were going through traumatic experience in life. Timely intervention and rescue helped them to overcome their trauma through counseling and education and residential care. Currently, they are continuing their education. When we compare both case studies, we can say that timely in intervention from state and CSOs will reduce the vulnerability of girls and women, prevent, prevent them from entering hazardous industries and experiencing exploitive situations in life. As we together can we stand united for climate resilience, promoting ecological economy, ecological education and spirituality, promote community engagement and participatory action, adapting a simple lifestyle, lifestyle and responding to the cry of the poor and the earth. Now we shall see few photographs where Good Shepherd International Foundation has supported during emergencies. Thank you, and back to Jenry. Well, thank you so much, uh, Govinda and Teskula, for giving us such an insight into uh, the significance um, of the integrity of the environment in relation to people living around the Himalayas. Um, you know, the displacement, the, the need for migration, changes in the local geography, significant floods, earthquakes, landslides have a huge impact um, on your people. And that was really powerfully um, explained to us by the two case studies. So thank you so much for sharing about the circumstance there in Nepal. And um, now we move to another country. We, we uh, invite um, Asti and sisters Maria Goretti and Enda to share with us um, the idea of what happens when you become disconnected from your land and how important reconciliation with the land is for our mental health our physical and emotional and spiritual well-being. And um, Asti and Maria and Enda are from Indonesia and we'll speak from their perspective. So welcome to the presentation. Um, I think you're going to begin, Asti, thank you. Yes, thank you, Jendri, for the time and the opportunity to share with you guys, with we all, you all, about the situations in Indonesia. From Indonesia, I will share with you actually, um, along with the International Forest Day um, today, we would like to share with you the situations on the forest in Kalimantan. Kalimantan is one island where um, Good Shepherd Indonesia um, has been working for many years. And today I'm, we will going to let the people from the Kalimantan, our participants, um, uh, our partners to tell you a story of their, their life experiences. So I will share you two videos. I will start with uh, one and then, and we uh, look into another one. Let me see. Thank <laughs> you. 
Aku ingin mengajak kau ke hutan Berkelana menulis puisi yang indah Puisi tentang hutan Mumpung belum punah Sekalipun keindahannya hanya sedikit Tentang pohon-pohon yang kita lihat di sepanjang langkah Jangan takut ada harimau, ular, beruang atau binatang buas lainnya Ada aku Aku bisa menjadi lebih dari harimau untuk membunuh harimau Atau aku bisa lebih menjadi ular dan beruang untuk membantai ular dan beruang Untuk mengusir rasa takut kau Tetapi tentu saja Binatang-binatang itu sudah tak ada lagi Orang-orang telah memelihara di dalam diri Ya Aku berharap di dalam hati Bila aku dan kau beruntung Kita akan mendapati kupu-kupu yang terbang Mungkin akan ada bunga anggrek hutan yang tumbuh liar di antara pohon-pohon besar yang aku pun tak tahu namanya lalu kau berteriak kira oh indahnya Indonesia termasuk dalam 10 negara dengan wilayah hutan terluas di dunia dengan sekitar 2% dari luas hutan seluruh dunia. Pada tahun 2020, penelitian Forest Resource Assessment menyatakan bahwa luas hutan Indonesia adalah seluas 92 juta hektar. Namun laju deforestasi hutan Indonesia begitu cepat. Skala perusakan hutan hujan tropis Indonesia begitu besar hingga berdampak pada iklim global. Ekosistem hutan hujan tropis dan lahan gambut menyimpan bermiliar ton karbon sehingga penghancuran hutan dan lahan gambut melepaskan emisi karbon ke atmosfer dalam jumlah besar. Indonesia saat ini menempati urutan ketiga di dunia sebagai pelepas gas rumah kaca terbesar di dunia setelah Amerika dan China dengan 85% profil emisi berasal dari degradasi dan hilangnya hutan hujan tropis dan lahan gambut. pergi menanggung kami mau cari udang siapa tahu masih ada udang dan ikan seperti pada waktu waktu kecil kita dulu oh iya ayo aku mau ikut menanggung ayo kita menanggung pasangnya saya lihat ayo, ayo. Menjadi puisi, karena mungkin lebih dari tidur, 
aku dan kau tentang hutan telah habis dimakan babi-babi yang berdatangan dari jauh. Hutan perlu segera diberi sayap agar segera terbang bersama kupu-kupu dan tidak merasa kesepian. Karena kupu-kupu bukan sepenuhnya aksesoris hutan. Bila suatu ketika aku dan kau beruntung akan bertemu kupu-kupu yang terbang bersama kupu-kupu secara terpisah. Lebih dari separuh hutan hujan Kalimantan hilang dalam 50 tahun terakhir berganti dengan perkebunan monokultur dan lubang tambang batu bara. Kini meningkatnya suhu bumi yang disebabkan pembakaran batu bara dan hilangnya hutan membawa bencana krisis iklim ke tanah bumi. Terlepas dari niat baik untuk meningkatkan kesejahteraan masyarakat yang tinggal di dalam dan sekitar hutan Kalimantan, hanya ada sedikit bukti bahwa konversi hutan meningkatkan kualitas hidup masyarakat yang tinggal di Kalimantan secara keseluruhan dan terlebih lagi bagi perempuan dan anak-anak. Dibandingkan dengan provinsi lain di Indonesia, Provinsi Kalimantan Barat memiliki persentase penduduk miskin yang relatif rendah, namun kualitas hidup penduduknya termasuk yang paling rendah. Saya lihat hutan di sini makin habis, ditebang dijadikan lahan sawit, bahkan bapakku pun melakukan hal yang sama. Dengan lahan yang kami miliki, saya merasa khawatir saat melihat ini, kukatakan kepada bapakku untuk tidak merubah semua lahan yang kami miliki menjadi lahan sawit. Walaupun bapakku tidak terlalu memperdulikan, tetapi aku ingin bapakku supaya tahu dan juga orang tua lain agar mereka tetap menyisakan lahan untuk kami galak supaya bisa berlahan menanam sayur-sayur dan pohon-pohon khas daerah hutan lainnya masih tersisakah hutan untuk masa depan kami? pada 2019, 20 tahun setelah perkebunan monokultur mulai masuk ke wilayah Kalimantan Barat Kalimantan Barat menempati peringkat kelima indeks pembangunan manusia terendah di antara 34 provinsi di Indonesia. Indeks pembangunan gender Kalimantan Barat berada di urutan keempat terendah di antara provinsi lain. Ini menunjukkan bahwa perempuan dan anak perempuan Kalimantan Barat lebih menderita. IPD diukur dari perbandingan capaian pendidikan, kesehatan, dan pengeluaran antara perempuan dan laki-laki. Perkawinan anak masih menjadi masalah serius. Menempati urutan kedua, tingkat perkawinan anak di antara provinsi lain di Indonesia pada tahun 2020. Masyarakat adat, khususnya masyarakat Dayak di Kalimantan Barat, secara tradisional merupakan penjaga bumi. Di banyak suku, perempuan memainkan peran yang sangat penting untuk mendorong terjadinya hubungan yang lebih berkelanjutan dengan alam. Hubungan perempuan daya yang dekat dengan alam secara khusus menempatkan mereka sebagai agen perubahan dalam upaya untuk memperlambat perubahan iklim. Memberdayakan perempuan dan anak perempuan adat agar dapat didengarkan suaranya dalam pengambil keputusan yang berpengaruh pada kualitas lingkungan di mana mereka hidup menjadi langkah yang penting untuk menjaga bumi.
thank you for um, um, for having the time to see our video. I thank Sister Enda and the Marau team for creating such a beautiful reflections of the how the forest has been um, disappearing from, from the Kalimantan land. I will now share you again uh, another experience of a woman in Kalimantan. This woman, Ibu Adriana, is actually one of um, a, a very close, very close to our Good Shepherd um, 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 congregations in Marau, and I will share you her experience with the losing, uh, the the disappearing of forests in Kalimantan, as it being rapidly uh, converted to um, monoculture plantations, um, palm oil uh, plantations in particular. So um, she will, I uh, this will be her story, and I will ask us all, us all to kind of like reflect on her experience. And uh, as we listen to her voice, um, let us reflect on how her life has been in the past 10, 20 years and how she is losing her land, her forest. And also I think um, how she is at the end of the day, losing her identity and herself. Let us see how we are her and, and that we are, uh, she is us. So I will take you to Marau. This is actually the common road um, going to Marau villages. Uh, let me go to slideshow. Wait. Okay. Uh, this is actually um, not um, a situation in the roads to Ma the road to Marau, especially the villages in Marau, where um, um, people having difficult access to come in or outside the villages, especially during the rainy season. And this is where also our sisters and also um, partners in mission from Good Shepherds has to go through uh, every day um, to be able to uh, do their works with Good Shepherd. Uh, and I would like us now to listen to Ibu Adriana. She's a 50 years old Dayak woman living in a disappearing forest in Marau district, West Kalimantan. And she will, we will hear her voice as she answered our questions, uh, some of our questions on uh, her experience. How do you experience the disappearing forests as it is rapidly converted to monoculture or palm plantations? Terutama sekali hutan yang kayu yang hilang ini kebakaran suster kebakaran sehingga kayu yang hilang itu kebakaran tidak terbatas sih menghilangkan kayu-kayu ini habis di makan api setelah dimakan api tumbuhnya lalang tumbuhnya lalang disitulah manusia yang ada di sini menanam pohon sawit lahannya digosor habis dijadikan sawit jadi ya, hutan-hutan yang ada itu sampai saat sekarang kalau tidak ada kebun lagi untuk cari bambu pun susah pergi ke sungai air tidak ada mencari ikan ikan tidak ada mencari itu babi rusa tidak ada lagi burung tidak ada lagi yang ada cuma suara sinso itu kalau mencuci pakaian putih, mencuci piring, mencuci sendok yang jatuh ke sungai sudah tidak kelihatan lagi. Keruh semua. Itulah yang menderitanya masuknya sawit. Air pun sekarang sudah. Ah, pokoknya namanya air di sungai itu tidak berupa air yang seperti dulu bening, bersih. Yang ada cuma lumpur, lumpurnya banyak. Kadang-kadang itu kalau udah memperbaiki parit apa segala, satu bulan pun nggak habis-habis kotorannya, airnya. Itulah mengakibatkan air yang tidak bersih lagi sampai saat sekarang. And how has this disappearing forest impacted your life as a woman and a mother? Beban ekonomi yang pertama sekarang itu suster memang menambah berat. 
bagi saya kalau nanam itu nanam sayur kalau dulu sayurnya segar tanamnya lepas saja kalau sekarang suster tidak dirawat tidak di apa-apa kan pokoknya sayuran itu tidak ada hasil bukan hasil mau dijual untuk kebutuhan diri sendiri tapi kalau dirawat sayur itu kalau sempat dikasih dikasih apa itu dia cukup bagus suster subur kalau saya sendiri ya menurut saya itu nggak sempat kalau pagi-pagi nggak sempat miram saya jam 3 berangkat ya sayur itu terpaksa kan udah layu semua tidak ada artinya lagi you decided to work at an oil plantation oil palm, palm plantation what is your experience working as oil palm plantation labor Pengalaman saya bekerja selama 9 tahun, saya bekerja di sawit. Saya pertama masuk itu kerja saya terbas, terbas kayu. Setelah satu tahun saya terbas, saya memupuk pak itu menggunakan zat kimia. Memang segala itu sipti yang saya gunakan ada, tapi di dalam perasaan saya sendiri yang merasakan bekerja dalam memegang saat kimia itu cukup berat rasanya kalau pagi-pagi bangunnya napasnya terasa sesak apalagi dibawa bekerja apalagi sekarang musim panas kalau sakit itu kepala cepat pusing panas tinggi ah macam-macam pokoknya penyakit yang dideritai apalagi sekarang kalau itu segala-gala orang-orang yang di kampung ini sakit semua apalagi saya pergi ke barak orang di barak semua karantina sakit semua sekarang yang saya rasakan cuma apa adanya yang saya gunakan saya menggunakan itu zat kimia itu yang difasilitasi dari kebun saya di, dikasih susu dikasih kacang hijau untuk menambah itu kesehatan saya mereka bilang and what hopes and worries do you have for the future harapan saya suster bagi anak-anak yang ada di sini saya berusaha menyekolahkan mereka supaya mereka itu mendapatkan bekal pemikiran dengan jernih gimana caranya kayu itu sudah tidak ada lagi mumpung saya masih mampu saya sekolahkan mereka mereka yang tidak mau dibilangi dikabari si pendapat tidak didengarkan ya terserah mereka Gimana caranya mereka untuk bikin rumah, bikin apa-apa. Kalau sekarang, suster, beberapa orang yang hutannya habis, jangankan mau cari pohon yang sebesar itu, ember sebesar apa, cari bambu pun susah. Kalau bikin rumah beton itu ratusan juta nilai uangnya tidak cukup, suster. Tidak bikin besar pun. Dari orang tua itu tidak mengerti. Yang hutannya sudah habis, suster, tidak mengerti mereka. Jual tanah perlunya biayanya uang. Biaya uang itu malah dibelikan ke perarat, perabotan rumah tangga seperti lemari, seperti apa. Bukan itu, bukan memikirkan ke depannya anak saya itu kemana sih arahnya. Apakah mampu atau tidak dia. Kalau saya enggak, suster. Saya pikirkan, ah, anak cucu saya ndak apa, saya ndak ada barang, saya apa adanya saya gunakan, barang yang saya simpan di dalam rumah cuma sebegini, ya ndak apa. Saya pikir, saya ndak bisa cari uang yang berlebihan, ya sudah, itu saja yang saya ambil, yang hasil pekerjaan saya. Kalau saya bikin jual tanah terus, satu hektarnya 10 juta suster satu menit pun uangnya habis dibelanjakan 
uang 10 juta itu mau beli apa sekarang suster nggak mampu saya melihat tanah yang digadaikan itu rasanya menangis mau kembali lagi seperti yang dulu dengan suara burung dengan lauk yang berlimpah kalau masa-masa seperti itu ya enaklah suster kalau sekarang nih jangan mau melihat ikan yang banyak daging banyak melihat seekor kancil lewat di jalan pun enggak pernah now i would like us to think about and reflect of what of all the things that she is saying um, and think about um, uh, these things um, how do we value the tangible and intangible advantages and disadvantages of preserving the forest in as com in compared to the tangible and intangible advantage and disadvantages of having a monoculture plantation on monetary gain on the loss of history on the healthy ecosystem on sustainable livelihood on having biodiversity the quality of abiotic things the water the air the soil the forest carbon that is kept within a, a, a forest uh, on education on knowledge and wisdom on climate change um, contributor and impact also inclusive and equitable and equal system ibu adriana is actually can be considered as a lucky family because she can um, send her children to study um will stop share here so she can send her her, her children to uh, studying her kids she has six kids her kids are, are going to university three of three of the six are going to university but the average of children in uh, West Kalimantan is only having six years of education, meaning that they barely graduated from elementary and only probably at top on uh, junior high school. So that's the, the common realities of people living in West Kalimantan. And as you can see, the road uh, in Marau, it would be worse for them. And uh, as mentioned, Kalimantan has one of the highest rate of child marriage in Indonesia. Uh, it also has, in 2017, it has the highest number of um, girls' um, pregnancy, uh, 100 teen pregnancy uh, among 1,000 birth, and then also it has um, a high rate of uh, children suffering from stunting and low birth, uh, low um, uh, weight uh, during birth. So in that, I will end a um, presentation from Indonesia. Um, back to you, Jenry. Oh, Asti, such powerful videos. You know, the first one, um, really a reflection on the facts about the loss of their land and their future. Um, such profound, you know, stories from those young women not being able to find the fish um, and the call of the young woman who was urging her father not to sell the land for the future. Um, and the powerful story of your friend, the woman who... Um, I'm sure everyone could feel the emotion in her voice, you know, as she shared about how her life was going. And the phrase that stuck with me was um, early on when she spoke that even the bird singing disappears, replaced by the sound of a chainsaw. So through your presentation, you've really um, given us an insight into the emotional side of this as well as the practical side. So. I've noticed a couple of people in the chat, books, uh, chat box commenting, and I see a number of you are relating to this experience. So we're just going to take a short pause together. Don't go anywhere. Just take a short pause and just think about what you've been hearing. Maybe write a little note or a few words about what you've been hearing so far in these presentations. And if you would like to share something, just raise your hand and my fellow presenters will hopefully alert me to a raised hand if there is one there. Just take a short pause to reflect on this situation.
So we don't have any questions so far in the chat box, but um, you know, a lot of gratitude for expressing the reality of people. Um, the, the video is highlighting the sufferings of women and children of the disappearing forest and the pain to see the impact of monoculture on ecology and the poor. And I just want to share with you all that when we were preparing for this session, um, Asti and um, Enda and um, Goretti were very keen to want to share the spiritual connection to the land and to share the emotions about what happens when we lose that connection and what we need to do to restore it. So I'd like to thank the three of them for that beautiful sharing. And if there's anyone with a question, just pop your hand up. I think we're just still reflecting. Asti, it was so powerful. Okay, well, perhaps if you've got a question emerging, write it in your journal and uh, we'll come back to it a bit later. So we'll just continue with the sharings. We're going to welcome back Emma um, from Australia, a very different culture, a very um, different experience of what the impacts of the uh, climate change are. And uh, she's going to experience, uh, um, share with us the experience um, from some of our practitioners, some of our staff um, who work with women in communities who are coping with multiple disasters uh, that can be attributed to the dramatic change in our climate over the past few years. So we're talking about you know, layers of experience. So Emma, I'll hand over to you now to, to share a very different story in a different place but still with impact um, on, on women and girls as well. Thank you. Thank you, Gendry. And thank you, Asti, too, for those, for sharing those incredibly powerful stories. And I think um, something I was um, reflecting on as I as I listened and watched was, you know, this, this is very close to Australia and decisions Australians make um, you know, have, have impacts in terms of palm oil supply and, and things like that. So, so thank you, Asti. I'll just share my screen. I think everyone can see that now. Not, okay. not yet, Emma, Emma, not yet. Sorry, mate. Not, not yet? yet? No. Okay. Not yet. <laughs> Let me try again, hey? No worries. Yes, it's coming through now. Thank you. And you just need slideshow, thanks. Okay. Are we all good now, Gendry? Yes, we're fine. Thank you, Emma. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. So today, Good Shepherd Australia is talking about the impacts of disasters on women and children as seen in our services here. And the speakers in this presentation live and work on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri, Nwang, Yamathang, Duduroa, Guna Kanai, Taunarong and Wairuru people. Aboriginal people are the first caretakers of all of these lands. This land always was and always will be Aboriginal land. We acknowledge that these First Nations communities are worst affected by climate change and are showing us the way in care of country and the fight for social and climate justice. So Australia is facing severe climate events and environmental destruction like droughts, catastrophic bushfires, and major storms and floods, uh, which you may have seen in the news recently. These events are compounding and recurring, leaving people exposed to repeated disasters. Australia is in the grip of extreme weather bingo. So first of all, this map shows um, drought. So recent droughts are, are widespread, longer and more severe. Across Australia, rainfall was far below average or even the lowest on record 
as we approach the end of 2019. And then the fires hit. Widespread bushfires followed those years of severe drought and record-breaking temperatures. Many people died, billions of animals were lost, and thousands of homes were destroyed. And over half of the East Gippsland area in Victoria, where Gendry and I are, uh, was affected by the bushfires. Then after some reprieve from the fires, Australia is now facing major storms and floods. Higher rainfall and stronger winds are causing more destruction to people's homes and livelihoods. We know that climate change fuels these extreme weather events. Global heating leads to more extreme weather. This means big storms and extensive flooding in the country and our cities. And, and the science is now establishing that as the atmosphere heats up, it's more energetic and it's capable of holding more water. So we get these big storms. And then long droughts and hotter summers with intense dry winds create the conditions for raging bushfires. And this photo here is of a child um, fleeing a bushfire area in Victoria, in East Gippsland. And these events have a huge impact on women and children. We continue to see one natural disaster after another. Floods, mouse plagues, heavy rains destroying crops. It's just ongoing. Um, communities are taking one hit after another. And what we're seeing is that there is still so much trauma present within these communities, having been left so very vulnerable to even the smallest impacts. The, um, there is very definite uh, mistrust of services. There's homelessness and displacement due to the lack of housing and also the significant hold up on rebuild on the rebuilding of, of their homes. Um, people, businesses and farms are still suffering significantly and isolation and, and fear are very, very prevalent. Not only are we now needing to meet those needs of um, the people that are, that are so very dependent on our services even more and their, their needs are becoming greater. But we're also seeing those um, newly vulnerable, those people that don't know or haven't known where to, where to turn to for help. In rural Victoria, our participants are facing more frequent natural disasters and weather events of increasing severity and duration. One woman I am supporting is now the sole income provider for her family after her partner was injured during the 2019-2020 bushfires and continues to experience trauma and mental health challenges. This is now compounded with the impacts of more frequent severe storms and flooding in the area, which result in road closures and damage to the homes and local infrastructure. Local resources and time is constantly being allocated to cleanups and repairs following these events. All of this impacts her ability to make money in her business and to access business support and to travel to work safely. Another participant who is a survivor of domestic violence has been impacted by climate change in the way of slipping through the cracks of support services that are inundated with increasing numbers of people who need support. She didn't know what support was available following the bushfires or how to access it and is only now getting the consistent mental health, medical, financial and and financial support that she needed years ago. From this experience, it appears that the impacts of climate change are widening the divide between those who are safe and financially stable and those who are not. So Good Shepherd in Australia works alongside women and families to build financial resilience in the face of these disasters and to support recovery following disasters. We offer two main services. Uh, one is a financial wellbeing pop-up in bushfire affected areas. And we also run a small business kickstart and recovery program known as Launch Me, um, also in bushfire affected areas. And these services are government funded and they allow different sectors to work together to support local communities. 
Hi everyone, my name is Ananya Tiwari and I'm the project lead for one of the two programs that we currently have operating across bushfire impacted regions of Victoria. The ultimate goal of both of our programs is to assist communities in rebuilding after devastating natural disasters. The first of our two programs is called Launch Me, and the goal of Launch Me is to assist micro and small business through personalized business coaching, interest-free business loans, and other support services. The second program is the one that I lead, and it's called the Good Shepherd Pop-Up, which operates across East Gippsland and Taowong. Through this program, we provide financial well-being services to low-income and vulnerable populations. We assist them through services such as no-interest loans, financial capability workshops, and one-to-one -one financial coaching. What's becoming um, very clear from these programs is that there's a need for, for multi-year programs of support and that that support is needed you know, long after the drought breaks, long after the fires stop burning and long after the floodwaters recede. There is a huge gap in the people who were affected versus the people who put their hand up for support. Two years on from the bushfires, we are now in the Launch Me project just starting to see people saying, I think I might be maybe ready to consider perhaps moving forward. The trouble is the funding's not there now. The support's not there. The agencies are starting to wind up and it's only a few agencies like Good Shepherd who are actually on the ground active and saying, we're here to help. We're here to do what we can. So with more frequent and intense weather events ahead, we really need to ramp up the support. What kinds of support would help women better cope with climate fuel disasters? What these communities really need is for their voices to be heard. And, you know, their, their real needs understood and met they're, um, they're, they really do need ongoing services to help them rebuild and become strong again so that they can create those sustainable futures for their communities, their families and their, their businesses. A, a big issue for Good Shepherd in Australia is that insurance is becoming unaffordable in many parts of Australia. So that's insurance for people's homes and cars and personal belongings. Um, here, governments rely on people purchasing their own insurance to get them through disasters, and, and this system is now very fragile. One of my participants doesn't have adequate insurance because increasing premiums and living expenses, it is just unaffordable. Families and women need the government to cap insurance premiums in areas that become more prone to the impacts of climate change to ensure they can cope with the aftermath of these situations. Also, to have advocates and support for those who are making claims. Looking ahead, two of the big issues um, are vi family violence prevention and recovery at times of disaster and supporting women to thrive in a changing economy. So as the economy transitions away from a fossil fuel economy. With increased disasters and stressful events, women and children need more access to violence and financial support in rural and regional areas that is private and tailored to the needs of these victims to survivors. From a prevention perspective, more education about this and the stresses that natural disasters and severe weather events can place on all people needs to be included in workplaces, sporting clubs, businesses, schools and childcares. Another factor that is really important from a prevention perspective is increased access to tertiary courses, upskilling and personal development opportunities, which ensures that women and families are resilient and adaptable to climate resultant changes in the economy. So what's our call to action knowing all this? Above all, we really need to slow down and ultimately reverse the global heating that's causing these disasters. So that means fair, fast decarbonisation this decade. At the same time, we need those adaptation measures, those resilience measures. So community-centred disaster support that's grounded in the knowledge and needs and aspirations of at-risk communities. 
sustained support for women that recognizes that we need a recovery um, focus and that recognizes that that long tail of financial safety and mental health impacts of disasters. We need more equitable resilience measures. Um, climate change resilience shouldn't just be for the rich. So that includes affordable and accessible insurance and ongoing financial support that recognizes that extra care work um, that often falls on women following disasters and that recognizes that widespread loss of livelihoods. We also need those tailored family violence services that understands what happens during disasters and, and the needs of women and families in those situations. And finally, in terms of building that long-term resilience, we need sustainable work for women in small businesses and beyond um, that adapts to changing economies, is part of the mitigation effort and builds individual and community resilience. We recognise that every fraction of a degree matters, every voice can make a difference and every second counts. And I'd like to acknowledge the Good Shepherd voices in Australia who are making every second count. That's Cherie, Millie, Nicole, Ananya and Yvette and the community members they stand alongside. Thank you um, for listening today and I'll now hand back to Gendry. Thank you, Emma, for um, highlighting um, those situations. Um, it does, it's hard to believe that even in a place like Australia that there are small communities, remote communities um, that are extremely vulnerable and are really struggling. And I think the point I sort of get from this talk is that, you know, disasters and severe weather conditions, um, and, you know, they don't look at what the economy or the um, culture or the politics or anything of a country is, um, we're all going to experience this. It's beyond um, place. Uh, so thank you for sharing um, that insight there. Um, and, and our final uh, reflection comes from Sister Elizabeth Joseph in Myanmar. And I just want to acknowledge um, Elizabeth for her commitment to being present at all our preparations, given all that's going on in Myanmar at the moment that you're all aware of, even today, um, very significant um, shootings and uh, violence in the district that she's in. So I just want to acknowledge her presence and her willingness to be with us. Um, so uh, Elizabeth's presentation gives us an insight into the root cause for climate change in her area and its impacts in Myanmar through the eyes of a young girl. So Elizabeth, I hope you're there um, and I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jendri. I'm, I'm from, uh, I'm Elizabeth from Myanmar and I'm going to present to you a case study on uh, drought and I'll sum it up in an animation video and I will share my screen with you.
and that's the end of my um, animation video. Thank you very much. Oh, Elizabeth, thank you so much for that incredibly creative way of enabling us to walk in the shoes of seeing my and other girls like her in Myanmar. Um, and also, you know, just uh, for calling out that the um, come, some of the, uh, what is it, root causes of not being able to even begin to address um, climate change when you have so many other issues going on around you politically and economically, et cetera. So uh, that was a, an amazing insight. And as I said earlier, thank you so much for your um, presence here today in spite of all that is going on around you. So we've had four, we've, we've listened to four very different stories and experiences, but we have one common theme very clearly that women and children are impacted by the climate change that is going on around us and impacted in quite a severe way, uh, as you saw in each of the different community representations. Um, as I said before, it, it's not limited to um, culture, economics or society. It's uh, something that is happening all around us in every single country. Um, we are very fortunate to have a guest speaking with us, but before I enjoy her, uh, I ask her to, sorry, um, come into the room to share with us, we were going to go into breakout rooms, but instead I'm gonna ask a couple of people if they would just be brave enough to put up their hand and share what the experience of listening to all of this is for them so far. What is your experience? Uh, maybe some feedback to the presenters, but what, are, what is touching you um, through these presentations? Don't be shy, we all know each other. We've been together in Zoom for weeks now, it feels like. Um, I'm sure somebody would love to share a reflection. If I don't spot your hand, maybe one of my team members will. There's a lot coming through the chat room. Anyone interested in just sharing verbally? We're hearing from you know some of the other countries that these things are very similar for them as well. India, for instance. So a lot of gratitude. Well, perhaps you're just um, needing to reflect on, on some of this a bit more. It, it's pretty, um, it's been pretty intense um, for us all to um, hear uh, these situations. Um, so I think that we'll move along. And if you would like to just let me know in the chat box, I'm happy to bring you into the room um, if you would like to share something. But um, we are very lucky today to have with us Mia Siskawati. And Mia is Head of Gender Studies Graduate Program in the School of Strategic and Global Studies at the University of Indonesia. Um, Mia has been actively involved in social movements in Indonesia, such as the women's movement, the indigenous people movement, and the environmental movement. She has been serving as a founding member and a member of the Board of Advisors of several women's organizations, including an organization formed by indigenous women of the archipelago of Indonesia and several other environmental organizations. Um, Mia is an, a subject matter expert, no doubt, with many qualifications, including a doctorate in anthropology. Um, Teresa, Mia is going to post your full CV in the chat box because there's so many, <laughs> there's so much in there. Um, it's amazing. But we're very grateful to have you here with us today. So I've got a fly. Very happy to have you with us today to give us um, a summary of what you've been hearing throughout the session and also to add some of your own key messages. So hand over to you now, Mia. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Jindri. Uh, this is really, I'm, I feel really grateful uh, to be here listening to all stories, uh, so much to learn so much uh, to think about, so much to reflect. And um, I think we all individually, uh, institutionally, then also uh, later structurally together, I think we really, really uh, need to continue what we have been doing and uh, uh, hope, hope for the uh, really like uh, uh, the good uh, steps 
uh, in response to climate change. And of course, we would like really to, to be able to um, mitigate the climate change and then to do adaptation and along the way. Uh, then also, of course, to uh, continue building responses. So <clears throat> I have uh, just like a few slides uh, as part of my responses of the very rich uh, uh, narratives and stories. So allow me to just uh, share uh, what I've been uh, really uh, like uh, reflecting on the uh, all the stories and lessons learned. Uh, can, can you guys all see my presentation? Yes, we can. Thank you, Mia. Just pop it on slideshow so we can see. Okay. That'd be yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So what I've been uh, hearing is uh, basically the lessons learned from Good Shepherd's integral ecology responses with attention to women, girls, and families, especially of vulnerable and marginalized groups. And <clears throat> I'd like to uh, start by, uh, of course, like uh, <clears throat> reflecting on the, uh, the the climate change that. <clears throat> uh, we know that the planet's climate has constantly been changing over geological, geological time. Uh, however, this current period of warming is occurring more rapidly than any other uh, past events. And this is really uh, alarming uh, for the environment, for the uh, social and cultural, and overall for humanity. And it has become clear that humanity has uh, contributed most of the last century's warming by releasing heat trapping gases, uh, we uh, know as the greenhouse uh, gases to power our modern lives, which is uh, uh, discussing about modern lives, is the modern lives of, uh, of course, different uh, varieties of uh, social contexts as well as uh, uh, cultural and political uh, contexts. And uh, we are doing this through burning fossil fuels for, uh, both industries, but also uh, nowadays, uh, also to support our uh, lifestyles uh, as well as our uh, consumption, and then uh, other activities that drive uh, climate change. From the presentation, <coughs> uh, Indonesia, uh, Nepal, uh, <coughs> Myanmar, uh, I'd like to make notes on the uh, structural underlying causes of climate change, which later have really uh, contributing to the uh, more problems, especially more uh, problems on gender inequalities as well as social injustices faced by women and girls, especially women and girls and families of vulnerable and marginalized groups. So the structural underlying causes of climate change, uh, there are several, but I'd like to pay attention on the large scale extractive industries because the presentations have uh, mentioned about that uh, in their <clears throat> stories and narratives. So started from the large scale industrial logging. So for developing countries, the large scale industrial logging um, uh, uh, massively like started uh, in the late 60s, 70s and several countries probably started at the uh, <clears throat> uh, late uh, 80s too. Uh, so the large industrial uh, logging, this is this is not a small scale logging uh, uh, initiated by the uh, the people, but by the industries uh, to really to uh, uh, like uh, uh, provide supplies for global market. Uh, after the forests have been uh, uh, cut uh, intensively, massively by the large scale industrial logging in several uh, countries. And we, we have learned from uh, Myanmar and actually uh, cases uh, in other Asian countries too, uh, is a large scale industrial mining. Then uh, in several uh, areas, uh, after the forest uh, depleted, then uh, arrived another large scale industrial monoculture plantation, including oil palm plantation, like the one, um, uh, as the presented uh, in the case of Indonesia. Another uh, large-scale extractive industries is large-scale industrial agriculture, of course, with heavy uh, chemical inputs. Large-scale uh, in some uh, developing countries, this is 
we're not talking only uh, like a, a thousand to thousand hectares, but it could be more for several contexts or several countries. Could be for one uh, area managed by uh, one company, could be more than one hundred thousands hectares. Uh, uh, in eighties uh, and nineties in Indonesia, even uh, there's a one company, one. Uh, private company received concession from the government that the area that company managed was in the size of the Switzerland. Uh, that's the size for large scale industrial logging. And nowadays uh, that area has turned into large scale industrial oil palm plantation. So in many developing countries, those industries established through state policies on land tenure that in uh, again, in several contexts, then it will be conflicted with uh, the uh, the land tenure developed by indigenous peoples and local communities. Also, uh, usually then uh, established through state policies on land use and management. And of course, then the environmental social implications um, uh, shared uh, by the presentation is started from deforestation, large scale land and forest fires, um, uh, mainly caused by land clearing for preparation of those industries. Imagine, imagine as the land clearing is in the massive uh, uh, scale of the land clearing. And land clearing meaning forest cutting, clearly land clearing. Then the loss of biodiversity, loss of knowledge and traditional wisdom, displacement of indigenous peoples, agrarian conflicts, then poverty and uh, uh, variations of uh, social injustices. All environmental and social implications have gender dimensions uh, along with other social and cultural dimensions and uh, it, it then uh, will create different problems uh, experienced by the women uh, and girls of vulnerable and marginalized communities so uh, climate change has worsened environmental and social economic crisis uh, uh, this is like the, the, the least of the uh, 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 environmental and social economic crisis, yeah? Uh, from the forest fires, landslides, big storms, and messy heavy rain that uh, shared by uh, presentation, floods, drought. Uh, I'd like to add massive pest attack uh, that uh, uh, not only then uh, 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 negatively impacted the 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 uh, crops, but of course the people, the loss of biodiversity and displacement of people and the varied forms of uh, social injustices. And as I mentioned before, all problems have really strong gender dimension and also strong social, cultural, political dimensions. Uh, so the climate change then also bring the gendered and intersectional vulnerabilities shared by the presentations. We have uh, seen how the, uh, the uh, uh, from the stories of Indonesia, Myanmar, also Nepal, the environmental crisis, and also uh, in Australia, New Zealand, the environmental crisis will be experienced differently uh, by women, girls, vulnerable and marginalized individuals and groups. Uh, and not only, sorry, maybe not will be, but already uh, have been uh, being experienced differently and differently not because of the biological uh, differences, but also because women, girls, vulnerable and marginalized individuals of different social groups have been experiencing gender inequalities and different forms of social injustices despite climate change related problems. So uh, uh, despite the climate change related problems, you all know in each different uh, social, cultural, economic, political context, women, girls, uh, and families of vulnerable and marginalized individual uh, groups uh, have been experiencing those uh, inequalities and injustices. So imagine like the, the floods, uh, of course, uh, will be faced and experienced differently uh, by uh, women of different groups, so girls, and then uh, also the elders, as well as women uh, with disability problems or women who uh, are pregnant or women who are nursing or women who have small children. And if they are coming from uh, the vulnerable groups um, like the poor or the marginalized groups, for example, for some context, they, they, their families or even their groups have been marginalized. Uh, could be marginalized politically or marginalized because of the conflicts uh, with the state or the conflicts with the companies. So uh, all the problems they have will be worsened uh, due to the climate change related problems. And uh, again, the 
uh, environmental, social, economic, political crisis due to climate change, as uh, shared by the uh, stories and narratives uh, by the all presenters, have been added uh, and will add more problems uh, for women, girls, and families of vulnerable and marginalized groups and other uh, uh, social groups. And I'd like now to uh, 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 reflect on the Good Shepherd's integral ecology approach, uh, which is, I think, uh, this 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 uh, approach uh, has been really, really uh, like a, a good, interesting uh, approach that remind all of us about the interconnectedness of environmental, economic, social, cultural, and ethical uh, issues. Uh, so uh, climate change has um, already uh, presented that climate change is not only the environmental problems or uh, climate change is not only environmental crisis, but climate change is also uh, uh, social, cultural, uh, even racial and economic crisis. So that's really a, a very good uh, approach uh, of Good Shepherd uh, uh, in line with the, um, the concept of integral ecology approach. Uh, what is more interesting is Good Shepherd has been uh, paying close attention to different needs. And I uh, recognize from uh, the uh, presentations of the uh, speakers that the needs not only needs are practical needs, but also strategic needs of women and girls of vulnerable and marginalized groups. Uh, practical needs uh, uh, relate to the uh, uh, daily needs and uh, uh, also, of course, the uh, basic uh, needs that uh, uh, need to be fulfilled in order to uh, survive. Like, uh, of course, like for example, talking about water or uh, clean water, um, uh, that's really like a part of the uh, practical needs uh, to continue the life. And for women and girls, of course, the clean water uh, uh, will um, uh, mean differently because of the the uh, reproductive uh, functions of the women and girls uh, and women and girls need uh, clean water differently. Uh, however, uh, from the presentation, I've learned that uh, uh, Good Shepherd already paid attention to the strategic uh, uh, needs uh, of the uh, women. For example, uh, like uh, the uh, approach is, is uh, also focused on the uh, uh, the uh, services as well as uh, advocacy uh, to uh, challenge actually to challenge uh, several uh, things, including the uh, social uh, and economic rights to advocate the social economic rights, including right to work uh, and also to have decent living, the right to uh, have adequate standard of living, the uh, right to uh, have safety and protection from violence, also um, the right to have enjoyment of uh, mental health. That's as part of the uh, strategic needs of women and girls uh, of vulnerable and marginalized uh, groups that Good Shepherd so far have been uh, paying also attention uh, as part of Good Shepherd integral ecology approach. Uh, also, I think uh, uh, Good Shepherd has been uh, moving beyond traditional ways of climate change uh, responses, uh, especially uh, like the organizations uh, focus more on the um, like uh, uh, emergency, uh, like responding to emergency uh, needs uh, of the problems or disasters uh, due to the climate change uh, uh, problems. Uh, what I mean, the um, Good Shepherd have been um, moving beyond traditional ways of climate change responses. I think what I've been learning from uh, the stories um, and also presentation is the uh, uh, in each context or each uh, place, uh, uh, Good Shepherd has been uh, developing uh, in uh, uh, its own way, of course, responding to the uh, each context, strategic approach to establish what I would say, uh, uh, an interconnecting and engaging ecosystem of support. So, uh, so uh, ecosystem of support, uh, meaning that a, a kind of ecosystem where a different kind of support and also involving uh, different like parties as well as different uh, ways of uh, support. And uh, so far, I've been hearing also that Good Shepherd has been developing uh, steps. Uh, toward more comprehensive responsive to climate change with gender equality and uh, 
social uh, inclusion uh, perspectives. And uh, before I uh, close this uh, short reflection, what I would like to uh, probably uh, uh, add is like, uh, uh, this is very interesting, like uh, this uh, Good Shepherd's Integral Ecology Approach. And uh, I think this is similar to the the uh, network of especially uh, women's groups as well as indigenous women's group, uh, women's network as well as indigenous women's uh, network, uh, ways to uh, approach the climate change uh, with attention to uh, women and girls of vulnerable and marginalized groups. And uh, if Good Shepherd also could uh, together with them then develop more uh, strategic uh, um, ways, including, uh, as Good Shepherd already mentioned, strategic advocacy uh, toward the uh, more comprehensive as well as uh, uh, strong like uh, ways of uh, building the uh, mitigation as well as adaptation to uh, climate change among uh, the communities where Good Shepherd and those uh, organizations work uh, 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 with um, it, that will be also uh, uh, we together we could build a kind of stronger uh, voices uh, for all parties uh, that need to be really uh, do kind of reform just like the uh, lady that in, in Asi's presentation uh, uh, she shared that, uh, that she really uh, like a uh, hope that uh, those uh, people that make decision out there and this is, of course, the the, the political uh, decision makers, the those um, who uh, hold capital that uh, support more on the large uh, extractive industries. They should consider uh, 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 wisely and thoroughly uh, how to respond climate change uh, seriously. And uh, last but not least, I think the attention to the young generation. Uh, uh, it's also really a good one um, because, again, uh, we need to do things for the future, but also we need to continue empower them so that they could really think about. And um, again, the story of uh, one uh, woman uh, uh, that are thinking about the uh, education for uh, her children uh, or for the future generation is very important. But then pro probably what we could think about is not the education to make them leave their uh, uh, place and uh, uh, chase so-called uh, different uh, way of lives that really later contribute more on climate change, but then uh, the education that could really um, make them reflect and then learn more uh, what they could do to really like uh, 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 protect and also uh, save uh, the ecological, social, and cultural resources so that together uh, they still could continue the the, uh, the ways of uh, saving, maintaining ecological, social, and cultural uh, resources in more uh, ways uh, with the gender equality and social inclusive approaches. So uh, thank you again. That's my sh uh, uh, short reflection on what I have learned uh, so far from the presenters. Uh, again, thank you very much. Okay. I'll, I'll back to you. Ah, thank you so much, Mia. Thank you for um, putting your lens on this issue um, and sharing your insights with us um, from your perspective. But I also love that you gave us a little bit of a challenge at the end, a bit of a nudge, as we say in Australia, to really um, kind of really look more deeply into our strategic and advocacy side of things. Um, and also to think about the young, it reminds me of Laudato C where the Pope speaks about this being an intergenerational issue and that we have to, in our thinking and strategy, be very conscious of those who come after us um, and what our responsibility um, you know, to them is as well as our own, of course, and the planet. So thank you so much. Now, a few people have found their courage in the uh, chat boxes to ask some questions and some quite powerful ones, really, um, which we don't have time to go into now, but that's not a bad thing because it's good to have questions at the end um, because this work uh, doesn't sort of, it's not complete in this two hours. We, we do need to go away and from the learnings here, there, there will be questions, um, opportunities to um, really look more deeply into some of these root causes. And the questions have been 
pretty much in the um, idea of these are macro and micro responses that we need to make um, to this issue. And uh, we shared quite a few things on the micro level, I guess, today. The macro is more challenging, as um, Mia pointed out, you know, sort of addressing political and economic um, structures, big, massive structures is quite a challenge. Uh, but we will try and find ways to do that. So um, I'd like to finish on a more personal note, and I'm going to ask Teresa to share something that came into my inbox this morning, quite coincidentally. And what came to me was uh, this um, uh, opportunity for us as individuals. It's a very personal um, opportunity to make a difference. I think it's a nice way to conclude. If we could just scroll up a fraction, Teresa, that'd be great. So um, the reflection has a quote from Thomas Berry, um, which is which in which he really talks about everything that we have said today, um, how much we are bringing about the devastation through changing the chemistry of the planet and disturbing biosystems, et cetera. That was really clear through um, the sharings that we had today. But I would like to share this uh, with you as an invitation to sit for five minutes at the end of each day and reflect on these questions. And they're from Paul Hawkins, Regeneration Ending the Climate Crisis in One Generation, Laudato C. Um, many things have to change course, but it is we human beings above all who need to change. And we say a lot about this in Asia Pacific, Our mind, it starts with a mindset shift. A great cultural, spiritual and educational challenge stands before us, and it will demand that we set out the long path of renewal. So um, another quote there, we are free to apply our intelligence towards things evolving positively. So in other words, that you know, in our mindsets and that we have the capacity to, to move energy, if you like, um, in that way um, and make uh, some, some impact there. Every action either moves towards a desired outcome or heads away from it. This number one guideline is a fundamental principle of regeneration. And it's with this in mind, every action either moves something towards or away that you're invited to um, do some personal reflecting. So as I prepare to rest tonight, ask yourself, did I have an opportunity to ref refuse, reduce, reuse, repair, renew? Did I avoid creating waste? And there's a number of questions there. And today, did my actions create more life or reduce it? Did my actions heal the future or steal the future? And you can see some more questions um, there. So I just wanted to share this. Um, and if you scroll all the way down, um, Tracy, you'll see the uh, beautiful um, flower there that will be the image that we've been using in a lot of our integration. Uh, so I thought that was interesting that that would be there as well. So Teresa is going to post this uh, into the chat box so you can copy and keep it and reflect on it yourselves. Um, I know it's a very personal response, but uh, as the quotes suggest there, it begins with the personal and it ripples out beyond there. And also I think doing your personal work gives you the courage to um, ask the bigger questions and maybe challenge some of the bigger institutions. Uh, so that's there. And the other thing to remind you, Teresa wanted me to remind you of was that this uh, recording will be placed in the YouTube uh, for people who couldn't make it. So if you could let them know that, um, they could um, touch base there. Um, Teresa, was there anything else um, that you wanted to share as well with us before we close? Uh, no, Jandri, um, thank you so much for today's session. I think from the CSW 66 programs that we've had so far, it's so obvious that Good Shepherd in Asia Pacific has actually grown so much um, mm. in terms of um, advocating on issues and bringing people together to talk about issues that are important to us and mm. the entire society. So I just want to mm. thank everyone. And uh, mm. also, we'll see you tomorrow and uh, on Wednesday for other CSW 66 sessions. Over to yes, you, Jenny. Thank you. Yes, please check the um, email from Teresa, which has the links to those. So I would also, as we close, really, again, Mia, very, very grateful. And thank you for being with us for the whole session to hear and your sharing, um, very inspiring for us and encouraging, which is so important. And also to the teams, there was more people behind the scenes than who presented from Australia, Myanmar, Nepal and Indonesia. There was a lot of people who contributed um, to the input 
So we want to thank all of you for the work you did to bring us such a inspiring and interesting presentations. Challenging as well, obviously. It's not an easy topic to discuss. So we wish you well um, going forward from here. Do tune into the other ones uh, in, in the next few days and do keep working on this um, the opportunity to, to make a difference uh, for women and girls um, and the environment as well. Thank you all for your time and uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa.